My name's Rob Lentz. I've been a comedian for about 25 years and I also do a lot of science shows and science programmes, things like uh, The Infinite Monkey Cage on Radio 4. And I just got asked to do this. I've done events with Francesca Martinez before. Uh, I think her political campaigning and the things she got involved with are always interesting and I think the idea of the People's Assembly is a very important thing in the modern media age. In terms of the modern media, I'm in a very fortunate position, which is the main programme that I make between Brian Cox and myself we, and, and our producer, Sash, we can just do what we want to do. We've never had any political intrusion, scientifically, all of these different things. At the same time, when I, I very rarely get involved in political programmes. I, mean, I have been asked to do things like Question Time and the Sunday morning things, and I don't think someone like me should be on those shows anyway. I would like to see a greater number of people who can properly think in an evidence-based way, who can deliver information. And I think that at the moment, across the board in our media, we have, it's never been more apparent that everything is created for the sake of entertainment and the hope that it will trend on Twitter. And so I've given up in the same way that I don't read newspapers anymore and I don't really watch any political... I, I tried to watch Question Time the other day and after five minutes I just... There's a little bit of blood just beginning to come out of the corner of one eye and I had to stop. The variety of opinions that is available for mass media has... Uh, the, the, the breadth is just getting less and less and less and what is meant to be left and what's meant to be right is the Guardian versus the Telegraph, whatever, actually, especially as we saw with Jeremy Corbyn, things is uh, once someone who is not part of the status quo mainstream gets in, no one seems very happy in the mass media. What worries me is I think there is something in the air. I think when you... Uh, Peter Hitchens actually wrote a very nice piece about when he went and saw Jeremy Corbyn. By chance, he was in Cambridge, he heard Jeremy Corbyn was on, and he was so impressed by the fact that one... The room was so full he couldn't get in. Jeremy Corbyn came out and spoke to the people who had to go outside. There are an enormous number of people. I find from touring the UK as well and beyond with very diverse opinions which are not reflected in the media. There's a story of a friend of mine who is a, a DJ and he once did a show where he was allowed to just once play only the music he wanted to play. No playlist at all. He had the largest number, I mean, in terms of emails, in terms of letters, uh, just vast. And when he took it to the executives, they went, well, this doesn't really mean anything because they're not our demographic. And I think maybe there's an increasing number of people who are out on the streets, who are going to meetings, who are getting involved in campaigning, who for some reason have been decided are not the demographic that's required. Does that make sense as a point? I hope it does. Well, that's the advantage, of course, of if you have a story about a Prime Minister putting his penis into a pig's head. That can then... I mean, my first thought when that story came out was, oh, my God, what is the legislation that's about to go through while we're busy doing caricatures of penises and pig's heads? And I realise that I've reached that point now of paranoia in the world, but there are quite a few examples. Um, and I, and that, that's the bit that, that fascinates me, which is the refusal to... Um, there was actually, I was thinking there was another example of that recently where you just go, why, well, in fact, today, the march, you know, the march here in Manchester, and from my experience, it was a very peaceful march. There were a lot of uh, flamboyant and interesting banners, and yet the first thing that I saw about it from people who weren't here is, did you hear four people were spat at? The chief constable of Greater Manchester Police Force had said what an excellent march it had been, but that doesn't matter now, the march is not about food banks, it's not about child poverty, it's not about the NHS, it's not about any of the issues that will affect millions and millions of people. It is about the four journalists who were spat at. We, there's still an enormous number of people who believe that the mass media is unbiased. Uh, they, and there are probably a lot of people in the mass media who really don't see themselves as biased. We are all constantly battling. That's one of my favourite terms from Timothy Leary and uh, Robert Anton Wilson, the reality tunnel, the reality that we're in. And of course, for someone like me, I'm from a nice middle class uh, background, nice middle class town. The number of upcycling shops down my road, oh, you'd be astonished. But because I was brought up on television, that you know, ITV used to have, I think it was five documentaries, political documentaries a week, Monday through to Friday, first Tuesday, World in Action on a Monday, uh, I mean, so, and every single, and you can, you can buy some of these now, you can see them on YouTube, that doesn't exist now. So for someone like me, really, it does take a certain amount of effort to in any way believe 
that there are people who are in poverty. And the moment that you mentioned, like for instance, when I was arguing about the march today, uh, five different people, this was in the space of 10 minutes, went, oh yeah, well I imagine the really posh restaurants will be doing well tonight, because of course everyone who goes on those marches is all in posh restaurants all the time, they're all travelling first class, and they're in the same way that everyone, no one, the number of people who really don't believe there is any real poverty in the United Kingdom, the statistics of, ch of children's poverty in, in the United Kingdom are abysmal considering where we actually stand economically in the world. And uh, nevertheless, people will go, yeah, they've all got flat screen TVs and, uh, and iPhones, though, haven't they? No. No, you know, again, that I'm, I'm lucky, I think, in the fact that so much of my uh, work has been travelling around the, the whole of the UK. And sometimes you do turn up into those towns where you know you're not going to sell very well, and the only thing, the only industry going there is the chipboard to be nailed in front of all the closed shop windows. And yet we, we've been persuaded that everyone actually... They've got the flat screen TV. That's fun. I mean, it's so dull to even go through the, all of the statistics and all of the evidence that shows that a country with greater disparity between the richest and the poorest ultimately is an enormously costly affair. It is made much worse for the whole of society. And there is also a point, as someone who is comfortably off, where I think, well, like, I, I'm, I'm able to turn down geeks which sometimes have silly money. So I got off to a stockbroker gig the other day. And I didn't feel comfortable doing that. I'm in very comfortable. But part of that also comes from the fact that I know that I've, I've reached a point in my existence where when I go to the supermarket, I don't have to look at the price of things. I mean, I do, because I don't want to be ripped off the price of yogurts in Waitrose. But nevertheless, I, I, so that to me, I find it a bit weird that once you go beyond that, you need to accrue more and more money. And we have so much come to believe that the only victory is a victory of wealth. But I looked at the ambitions in the magazine, and all the ambitions were about hedge funds and they were about marble swimming pools. And you think of the ambitions of Albert Einstein or Albert Schweitzer or Edith Cavell or Marie Curie. You think of the ambitions of some of the great philosophers, the great scientists, the great explorers. And they, would have, they did not look at each different thing as being, I'll tell you what, I've seen a guy like Everest, but I'm not sure it's financially viable. I mean, something that I might get very angry about on stage tonight, I don't know, is the very content provider. Once that exists as an idea, that this, that everything, all you're doing is provide, it doesn't matter what the content is. It is like the idea that Monet's, you know, water lilies is, is wall filler. That's all it is. Monet, I want you to do a painting for me. What would you like on it? Well, as long as it's four foot by three. What? I just mm. need that bit of wall covered. That's all I want. I think the Large Hadron Collider and other similar... Uh, well, partly, of course, one of the great things about CERN is that it was it's built to have a united group from many nations working together. The other beautiful thing about something like the LHC and the other things that go on at CERN is we may not see immediate, this is how much we've made off the back of this research, but much like, you know, the Apollo missions, they made their money back. This was not just, it wasn't just we had that moment and Neil Armstrong stood on the moon. The things that we've learned and the things we learn of what it is to be human, whether it's that dealing with the very, very small or the very, very large. I think that's one of my favourite things is Carl Sagan's Pale Blue Dot, which is where he muses on an image taken from Voyager, the planet Earth, I think taken from, is it from Saturn? I can't remember actually. And uh, it's just this Pale Blue Dot. And he has this wonderful bit where he goes, um, think of all the bloodshed, so men could be the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. It's a beautiful book which muses on the fact that even from the parochial distances that are within the solar system, parochial when we think of galaxies and universes, this is a tiny dot, a huge amount of potential which can go either way. And I think that, yeah, that's part of where I think science is so important, that when you realise all of the different things that we're dealing with, this is a small planet, it has conscious life, it has life that can question itself and question the universe, and we have the possibility of using that with empathy and altruism to improve humanity in the world around.